Well, you've learned a lot about locomotion. We've covered a few topics, gait terminology, force measurements, energetics in walking, simple models of walking, walking versus running, elastic storage of energy. We're gonna close out by talking about two important topics. One is gait transitions. We'll discuss that a little bit more. And what's missing from these simple models. We ended last time on a key principle, and that is we walk at a speed that minimizes our energetic cost per distance traveled. And these energetic costs are an important driver of gait transitions. We want to be down here at the minimum. We want to be burning the minimum energy per distance traveled. What you can see is that if you walk faster and faster, this is going back up. And what you'll see is that as you walk even faster, which I'm showing here, so again, what I'm plotting here is the uh, energetic cost versus speed. And what you see, here's our plot for human walking. When you see when you start to walk a little faster, the energetic cost goes up, and here it is for running. So you can run at a cheaper cost than you could walk. In fact, it would be very hard to even walk at that speed. So one of the drivers is this energetic cost. In fact, if you're, instead of trying to get somewhere in a hurry and walking at this roughly two meters per second walk to run transition speed, it's better to walk fast and then run for a little bit and then slow down and walk and run rather than be right at that transition. Now, horses are interesting because while we have two primary gates, walking and running, horses have three, walking, trotting, and galloping. And what you see is they make these gait transitions. So here's the energy cost going down. That's a beautiful walking speed for that horse. If they want to go faster, energy cost is going up. And then when they break into a trot, they can reach a speed where they're going now much faster using the same metabolic cost per meter. They're using much more per time, but they break into a trot to save energy. And the same thing, they'll break into a gallop where their energetic cost is lower here at that certain speed than it is for a trot at that same speed. So energetic cost of locomotion is a critical feature that drives transition from one gait pattern to another gait pattern. But that's not the only factor that drives gait transitions. Gravity also affects gait transitions. There's a striking example of this. If you look at individuals when they first walked on the moon, we are trained to walk in 1G, but when we got to the moon, they couldn't actually walk at a very high speed. So their walking speed uh, before they would take off and take flight was very low. So they adopted this bounding gait on the moon. And that happens for a simple reason. If we think about, go back to our inverted pendulum model. We have a mass sitting on top of a leg and it's moving in this direction during walking. So the inverted pendulum is rotating, there's going to be a certain speed, V, above which you'll take off from the ground. And we can compute that speed. It's when the centripetal force exceeds gravity. So the centripetal force is V squared over L. So that's the centripetal force along this line. And when that's equal to the gravitational force, so gravity can provide just equal to V squared over L, you will be just about to take off. If V gets bigger, then you will be actually flying off the ground. If L gets smaller, then the peak speed at which you can walk is also lower. Now, on the moon, we saw that gravity went down. So the peak speed at which individuals could walk on the moon was one-sixth of what it is on Earth. So they adopted this bounding gait. 
But we also see at the peak speed, so that the speed special is equal to g over l square root. So this speed at which you transition from walking to running under the influence of gravity is also affected by leg length. And you can see this beautifully here in this video of a mom walking next to her little boy. So those two are, are walking, and the mom is walking, but the boy with his short legs at that same speed has to run. And that's because he reaches that critical speed of walk to run transition at a lower speed than his mom with longer legs does. So energy affects gait transitions and gravity also affects gait transitions. Now a couple other concepts to think about with locomotion, and that is the walk to run transitions for various animals. A key question is, as big animals get big, could they run? There was a, a wonderful postdoc in my lab named John Hutchinson who was interested in this question of whether an animal as big as an elephant could run. He found uh, animals in American zoos could not run. They weren't very motivated and in shape, but there was a race in Thailand that John attended. They were excellent runners, and he wanted to see if elephants were walking or running when they moved at high speed. They don't have a flight phase where they're running like humans do, but their dynamics of very fast walking look a lot like running. So they use this kind of hybrid gait where they're a little bit more flexed, their dynamics look a little bit like running, but they actually have one foot on the ground. That brought up another interesting set of questions about big animals, and that was, could a T-Rex run? It turns out what we'll see as we move to the transition in muscles, it would have been very hard for a T-Rex to run. Remember, we learned that the forces against the ground during running are on the order of three body weights. So that would require the muscles to generate three body weights versus of ground reaction forces. And for an animal the size of a T-Rex or a giant chicken, that would be almost impossible. So very likely a T-Rex moved in a way that was similar to uh, the elephants did, where they kept one foot on the ground, they moved pretty quickly, but they were uh, doing more of a fast walk or what we call a groucho walk than they were a, a beautiful run with a flight phase. <laughs>So what are the simple models that we've seen so far? We've done a spring mass model of running, an inverted pendulum, ballistic walking model, and dynamic mo walking model. So what are their relationships? So here's the inverted pendulum model here, very simple. The ballistic walking model takes this as the stance leg and adds a swing leg like this so that we have a simple ballistic walking model. The dynamic walking model changes that and adds feet. This allows it to take steps uh, and repeated gait cycle that's stable. So these models are in contrast to the simple model of running that we've developed that looks something like this. So simple mass sitting on top of a spring that has stiffness K. And as I mentioned, while these models are quite simple, they're also powerful. We can see next time we'll be able to use this model to analyze the dynamics of running tracks. And we'll be able to extend the dynamic walking model for a variety of applications, including clinical applications. That said, there are critical elements that are missing from these models. And I would say the most critical element is muscles. So what I'm showing here is a three-dimensional dynamic simulation of muscles, of, of walking that's driven by muscles. There are big advantages to having muscles in your model. The key is that you can figure out which muscles are causing what motion. And for us who are interested in understanding peak athletic performance and how to help individuals who have physical limitations achieve their peak performance, we need to know which muscle is causing what motion. 
We can't do that with those simple models. They simply don't have muscles. But in a three-dimensional dynamic simulation of walking, we can. So to get to that, as the class moves forward, we'll talk about an, an extension of the simple running model, and then we'll talk about how we can characterize the biology and mechanics of muscle. We'll then bring that all the way around to look at detail of these three-dimensional muscle-driven models of locomotion. So let me just summarize the set of principles we've covered during locomotion. We've talked about just basic terminology, stride length, swing time, ground reaction forces. Some key concepts are these mechanical properties of locomotions. Newton's second law, the gravitational and potential energy during running and walking, and the elastic environmental influences. So how do tendon elasticity affect locomotion? And how does gravity affect locomotion? And finally, we just touched on, and we'll get into this much more, simple models versus complex models. So that's where we're headed.